This weekend at UFC 285, John Jones will be competing for the vacant heavyweight title. Assuming we don't get any surprises from now to then, oh my god, did I just jinx it. And while this very well could be a defining chapter in his legacy, the story of John's career up to this point is a complicated one filled with absolutely unbelievable triumphs and abject awfulness. It's a career defined as much by his greatness as his shortcomings, and since it's been a whole three years since he last stepped into the cage, I thought now would be the perfect time to catch you up on Mr. Bones' wild ride from his humble beginnings to his many rises and falls from the top. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and this is the brilliant and disappointing career of John Jones. What's up guys, massive thank you to FanDuel for sponsoring this video ahead of UFC 285. John Jones returns to the Octagon this Saturday to face off against Cyril Gaon with the heavyweight championship on the line, and FanDuel wants to get you in on the action. Right now, new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Bet on who will win, how they will win, when the fight will end, and so much more. The entire card is absolutely stacked, but I think I'm going with Gone to overwhelm Jones and get the stop, Shevchenko to retain over Grasso, Rachmanov beats Neil, Gamrot takes it against Turner, and Nickel debuts with an impressive and quick victory over Pickett. So don't miss out on your chance for a no-sweat first bet, up to $1,000 in bonus bets when John Jones takes on Cyril Gone for the heavyweight title. Go to FanDuel dot com slash bet that's fanduel.com slash bet to learn more exclusively on fanduel america's number one sports book JBJ's path to the cage started in his basement as a child. Due to his strict upbringing, there was no cable TV, secular music, or leaving the house past sunset ever. But there was a makeshift wrestling mat in the basement where John would spend his free time unsuccessfully shooting power doubles on his two brothers, Arthur and Chandler, who would both go on to win Super Bowls. As it turns out, grappling with a couple monsters regularly is really beneficial to your wrestling, as is doing freestyle and Greco pretty much nonstop from the time you're in seventh grade. In 2005, Jones would win a New York State Championship his senior senior year of high school with dreams of NCAA gold. Iowa and Iowa State were both interested, but John didn't have the grades, so they got him into Iowa Central Community College in the meantime, where he would win a JUCO national title his freshman year. It was there that he roomed with Joe Soto, who was really into this MMA thing, but Jones thought it was a bit much. Early in his sophomore year, Colby Covington moved in with Jones and Soto, prompting JBJ to transfer to Morrisville State in New York. I'm just kidding, it wasn't because of Colby. John decided to give up on the sports dreams and become a cop, but five credits short of getting an associate's degree in criminal justice, his longtime girlfriend got pregnant, and so Jones dropped out and took a job as a bouncer to make cash. Then something absolutely random happened. Somebody on Twitter told John that he should check out the local MMA gym in Cortland called Bomb Squad. And so he did, just like that, on a whim. He told the New York Times, quote, It's the God's honest truth. I had no real intention of being a UFC fighter, and this guy just threw the idea out there and I went for it. Five months later, Jones would make his professional MMA debut at a Holiday Inn against self-proclaimed bar brawler Brad Bernard. Yeah, we get Brad uh, Bernard here, the uh, barroom brawler, from what it says here. We got some big boys tonight. Let's see what happens. Jones with a suplex! Osbix! He flipped him over. Now he's raining some left hands down onto Bernard. John would sling this guy around before getting a TKO in 90 seconds. The illegal soccer kick afterwards was just for fun. It definitely was, uh, looked like he was kind of a sore sport here. He needs to learn some, uh, you know, some cage etiquette. Over the next three months, going hilariously by the nickname Sexual Chocolate Jones. Jones would score finishes in five straight bouts, earning the USKBA light heavyweight title at Battle Cage Extreme 5 because MMA promotions are named by edgelords. A whole four months after his professional debut, the 6-0 Jones would compete at UFC 87 against Andre Guzmao in a two weeks notice light heavyweight bout on the prelims. The 21-year-old would now sadly go by his childhood nickname, Bones, given to him by his high school football coach for being so tall and skinny. There was buzz immediately due to JBJ's insane 84 and a half inch reach, top tier 
grappling, and kitchen sink striking. The latter learned watching YouTube videos and reading technique books at Barnes & Noble. The UD win would be followed by a highlight reel spinning back elbow against Stefan Bonner in his sophomore effort on his way to a second decision victory, this time on the main card of UFC 94. At the historic UFC 100, it was back to the prelims where Jones got his first finish in the promotion, a second round sub of Jake O'Brien. That summer change was in the air and it was dry as hell because Jones was headed to Albuquerque, New Mexico to train and compete under Greg Jackson and Mike Winklejohn. His first bout with a new team would be against Matt Hamill as the co-main event for the Tough 10 finale. Jones would controversially lose the bout via disqualification after mauling the hammer but using a few 12 to 6 elbows in the process, a stain that he and the UFC have been trying to wipe off ever since. I made it to the UFC after only nine months of MMA training. There was a lot of rules and a lot of things about MMA I didn't understand. To make an honest mistake and, and throw an illegal elbow and, and have everything take, crash and burn, you know, it, it uh, I don't beat myself up about it, you know. Next in two headlining bouts, Jones saw back-to-back -back first round TKOs of Brandon Vera and the janitor Vladimir Matyushenko, putting the bony one on a collision course with undefeated tough winner Ryan Bader. After subbing Darth, John was surprised in the cage with a six weeks notice title shot against Shogun Hua. Yeah, I got six weeks, so uh, I have an after party tonight, but I definitely won't be drinking. It's, uh, it's right back to the drawing board, and I think everything happens for a reason, and I'm not afraid of this moment. I feel as if it's, it's my moment. A bout made because his teammate Rashad Evans was forced out of the opportunity with a knee injury. Betters weren't worried about the quick turnaround, though, and neither was Jones, who came into the 205-pound title challenge at UFC 128, the betting favorite. He was even signing autographs before the fight as champion 2011. Hours before the card, he would chase down a thief before heading to the arena. Dude, they just got mugged. He just broke my window open, and he took all my stuff, and he's running. And I just started running, right? And you know I got these gazelle legs. So the guy looks back, and then he trips over his own foot. Came up with my foot and, like, scooped it out from under him with my foot. And so he's down on the floor, and, you know, I'm thinking, like, I hope I, hope I don't get stabbed right now. So I ground upon him. Greg Jackson just comes out of nowhere, jumps on the guy's back, and he starts speaking Spanish. Like, you know, I'm like, you know Spanish? So I grabbed him, and I, like, figured for his legs and I set on his legs. To become the youngest UFC champion in history at 23 years old by TKOing Shogun in the third, a record that still stands to this day. The celebration was short-lived though as the UFC brought Rashad into the cage post-fight to set up the money-making teammate versus teammate championship bout. Well, actually teammate versus former teammate as Evans pieced out of Jackson Wink, feeling betrayed by his coaches. Everything had tied to it, you know. I, I lost uh, a good friend, Greg Jackson, you know, a great coach and some of the relationships that I had over there has been fractured as well. It's unfortunate, to be honest, and it's, and it's really sad. It wouldn't happen, though, at least not yet. Jones had a torn ligament in his thumb, which was initially believed to sideline him for the rest of the year, and so Rashad took on and defeated Phil Davis instead, ensuring that he would be next in line. But he wasn't, because as it turned out, John's thumb wasn't as bad as they thought, and so he instead next fought ultra-popular former champion Rampage Jackson at UFC 135 for his first ever title defense, and he absolutely dominated. Flawless victory, no notes, fourth round sub. So now it was finally time for that Evans fight, right? Oh yeah. It's all coming together. Nope, it sure wasn't. This time Rashad was forced out, and instead John would defend against Lyoto Machida at UFC 140. The Dragon proved troublesome early, but JBJ took over in the second round and scored a sick technical submission win. Then it was finally time to settle his very bitter rivalry with Rashad. The former teammates would beat at UFC 145, and Evans had nothing for the champion, being outstruck 116 to 49 and going 0 for 4 on takedown attempts, losing four of five rounds on all three judges' cards. Now three defenses into his reign with a taxing feud behind him, the real troubles would begin for Jonathan Dwight Jones. A few weeks after the Evans win, Bones would be arrested in New York for DWI after crashing his Bentley Continental into a utility pole. John had cultivated a very squeaky clean, early Kurt Angle type persona that many of his opponents and fans felt was fake. Because you know why? I won't. Your fabric is fake. My fabric is You're fake. fake. Tell me how my fabric shot. I'm not gonna get into that right here. Okay. You know, I know. So to them, this was foolproof they were right. Then John landed a global Nike sponsorship, the first to be on that scale in MMA ever, which only made the same crowd even less happy. Things would culminate a few months later when his refusal to defend the title against Chael Sonnen on very short notice after Dan Henderson pulled out. You know, I, I just don't know why he won't fight me next Saturday. I, I, what else does he have to do? All he's doing is delaying the inevitable. This was his big opportunity to get me on eight days notice. Resulted in UFC 
151 getting canceled entirely. While not his fault, the UFC, the fans, and of course the American Gangster dumped the whole disaster on Jones, a bitter wound that would never fully heal. John did accept a bout for the next numbered event, UFC 152 against Vitor Belfort. The Brazilian had Jones dead to rights with an arm bar that did permanent damage, but Jones persevered and won via a key lock in the fourth, to the disappointment of the fans who had nearly all turned on him by this point. Years later, it would be revealed that Vitor had some questionable lab results prior to the bout and still competed, adding further to the rift between John and the UFC brass. As a result of this whole 151 kerfuffle, Chael chailed his way into a season of tough coached by himself and Jones that would culminate in a failed title challenge at UFC 159. The heat surrounding Jones over the last year set the stage for his title defense against Alexander Gustafsson at UFC 165. The mauler was landing more than anybody ever had, he was hurting Jones, and he even scored a takedown of his own while holding JBJ to only one of 11 himself. Ultimately though, the champ's near superhuman ability to adjust in fights would see him win the day via a UD as he rallied late. While certainly close, the fact that Jones had never been in trouble and everybody hated him I think played a factor into the robbery claims, but feel free to fight me in the comments. Yo, Tommy Tune! Oh, that's it. You insulted my honor! I eat your what now? I demand satisfaction! Oh! I challenge you to a duel! Following a five-round dismantling of Glover Teixeira at UFC 172 for his sixth straight title defense, the rematch was set with Gus for 178. However, Viking Man tore his meniscus and would be replaced by the undefeated Olympic wrestler turned heavyweight fighter turned light heavyweight fighter Daniel Cormier, who had been calling Jones out ever since he entered the promotion and was perceived as the truest threat to JBJ's reign. The two got along swimmingly. Someone else. Ooh, yeah. And that's when it's gonna get good. It's gonna be intimate. And passionate. Oh. And passionate. <laughs> I'm gonna make him my wife. Professor, You're gonna be Mrs. Jones, Jones for the night. That is not true. Good I'm job. gonna rub on that big old belly. It's gonna be right in your face. I'm gonna put it right in your face. I'm gonna take it uh. on. A, I'm gonna smother you with my big old fat belly. If you don't factor in the constant back and forth on social media, in interviews, at pressers, the brawl they had in the MGM Grand Lobby. <laughs> ESPN hot mic incident. Hey, are you still there? You're the scum of the earth. You are a terrible human being, but you can sure turn it on, huh? Thank you. I wish they would let me next door so I could spit in your face. Yeah, this was the most heated rivalry in the sport in some time. And because the bout would get delayed to UFC 182, the bad blood was allowed to continue to boil. Jones would even blame losing that big Nike contract we mentioned earlier on the presser fight with DC, but in reality, his contract had expired and they decided not to re-up. John would remove all doubt about who was the better fighter, though, when he and Cormier finally met in the cage after an exhausting build, completely shutting down DC's wrestling and earning 49-46s across the board. A crotch chop at the closing horn let everyone know that there would be no making up following the fight, and there still never really has been. Three days after the biggest win of his career, Insac announced that they'd found a cocaine metabolite in John's system out of competition prior to the bout, a non-violation that was erroneously made public. As a result, Jones would check himself into rehab before releasing himself a day later and be fined 25k by the UFC. Nevada said oopsie, but the damage was done to John's already damaged reputation. JBJ's next defense was meant to be against Rumble Johnson that coming May, but a month prior, Jones would fully sabotage his career and life when he ran a red light and hit a vehicle crossing the intersection, which then crashed into the front end of another car, before fleeing the scene on foot without bothering to check on the injured parties, one of which was a pregnant woman who had broken her arm. JBJ was given 18 months probation, stripped of the UFC title, and suspended indefinitely. After another vehicle-related run-in with the law that saw Jones get another slap on the wrist, it was announced that after over a year-long absence, Jones would return at UFC 197 to reclaim the light heavyweight title, which was now being held by bitter rival Cormier. Unfortunately, DC got injured, and so Jones fought Ovin St. Preux for interim gold. Not John's best performance, he looked pretty sluggish in fact, but he got the job done earning a UD, setting the stage for the biggest rematch of all time at the biggest card of all time, UFC 200. Guys, for the record, for the record, an hour ago, John called me the lamest, biggest pussy he had ever met in his entire life. Now you are the biggest pussy I've ever seen, for sure. That was until two days prior to the card that USADA announced Jones had estrogen 
oxygen blockers in his system that he blamed on gas station boner pills. Something USADA agreed on, but Nevada was not so kind, and John was subsequently stripped of his interim title and suspended for a year. Three weeks after the suspension was lifted, Bones finally rematched Cormier at UFC 214, and while the first two rounds were competitive, a head kick in the third would spell the end of their rivalry, with John scoring a KO victory to finally recapture the undisputed throne after over two years without it. Angling for a big money fight, Jones called out Brock Lesnar after the win. Well, I just think it's a winnable matchup. Um, uh, obviously, Brock Lesnar has uh, millions of followers outside of MMA. He has a pretty limited game, and there's just so much reward that, that's involved. But turned out he would have other opponents to worry about, mainly USADA, as John's pre weigh in sample tested positive for Chirinabal, resulting in the victory being overturned. He was subsequently stripped of the title for a third time. After some arbitration that said the ingestion wasn't on purpose and potential assistance provided to USADA, Jones served a 15 month suspension when initially he was looking at 48. In his absence, Cormier became the double champ and essentially abandoned 205, leaving a vacant title for John to win upon his return in the long-anticipated rematch with Alexander Gustafson at UFC 232 in Las Vegas. But we can't have a Jones fight without a dumpster fire, and due to some pulsing picograms in his system of the Terenabal he failed for after 214, a trace amount that USADA determined couldn't have been from re-ingestion. How come this is the third time we're actually taking focus from the fighters and the fights and talking about what you have in your body, whether whether it's a picogram or a pictogram. Why why have you tested now? Positive. Uh, next question, please. Thank you. The whole card was up and moved to the forum in Inglewood, California, just days before the event because the picograms gave Nevada cold feet. The rematch would not live up to the first fight, with Jones KOing a lesser Gus in the third round to recapture the light heavyweight title yet again. This time, it would stay with him for over a year, where he would see three more defenses. The first, a total domination of Anthony Smith that he almost lost because of an illegal knee, and a pair of dangerously close call decisions against Tiago Santos and Dominic Reyes, the latter of which many still Fields should have gone to the challenger, which isn't to say he didn't have any hiccups during this time period. Stop right there, criminal scum! As he pled no contest to a battery case involving a waitress at a strip club, but it didn't result in any time off from the sport. Two months after the Reyes fight, though, John was arrested for aggravated DWI, negligent use of a firearm, possession of an open container, and driving with no proof of insurance, stemming from an incident during lockdown. Again, though, he was given a minor sentence of house arrest and probation and therapy and community service. Yeah! so nothing that affected his career. In the months after the incident, Jones was angling for a super fight with Francis Ngannou, but when negotiations with the UFC stalled due to, you guessed it, money, John vacated his light heavyweight title and said he was going to start preparing for his eventual move to heavyweight, i.e. gain a whole bunch of weight and wait till they give me my money. In September of 2021, the first Gus fight was inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, that night, John would be arrested for one count of misdemeanor domestic violence involving his fiance, a charge that was later dropped, and felony police vehicle tampering for smashing his head into the hood of a cruiser, a charge he pled no contest to and was given a fine for and made to attend anger management. In the aftermath, Jones was banned from his longtime gym by Mike Winklejohn. So at the moment, he's out of the gym. I don't know, I feel I had to do that, <sighs> ignoring it and uh, expecting different results, you know, as they say, is insanity. And since, Jones has moved to Jackson's MMA Acoma and has been training with Henry Cejudo at Fight Ready. And that's really the story so far. The next chapter, a huge chapter, and potentially the final chapter, is about to be written starting with UFC 285 and a vacant heavyweight title fight with Cyril Gunn, a bout that has the potential to define his legacy. To a point, it's still all very complicated, even if you don't care about any of the outside stuff at all. But given how much it's affected his career, you kind of have to consider it. Because yes, while we can look at him and say, wow, longest light heavyweight title reign, longest unbeaten streak, most successful title defenses, most UFC title victories, most light heavyweight division wins, but he was also stripped of the title three times and spent 42 months of his career suspended. And then there's this huge three-year gap leading to today. It's insane to say this, but it's like John underperformed as a fighter. His career's amazing, but it's also disappointing, which I know is a ludicrous statement, but if you think about what he could have done Done in those 42 months suspended, in the 36 months he spent away from the sport recently, without any of the title strippings, we could be talking about a 35-year-old John Jones with 23 title defenses. I know how absurd that sounds, but that's just filling in the gaps for lost time, assuming two fights a year, and that he never lost the belt, of course. 23. Would there ever even be an argument that he's not the greatest ever if he was at that number? So that's what I mean by disappointing. It's an interesting what-if, but ultimately it's just that. Jones 
Jones is who he is, and the future of his career and legacy await him this weekend. A massive shout out to the fantastic editor of this video, Luke Taylor. Please go follow him on his socials, he deserves the love. Like and subscribe for more JBJ related content, I can't stop myself from making videos about the guy. How do you see this weekend playing out? Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching everybody, see ya at the fights!